Welcome to the Australian National University's Malaysia Update for 2020. I'm Ross Tapsell, Director of the ANU Malaysia Institute. This biennial update conference is hosted by the ANU Malaysia Institute, which is based in Canberra. Our institute was established in 2016 to develop research and collaboration on Malaysian politics and society, but it builds on a long history of Malaysian scholarship at the ANU. More information about our institute can be found at malaysiainstitute.anu.edu.au. This year we're doing things a little differently, running the update virtually and working with Malaysia Kenny on the theme of alternative visions for Malaysia. Although this conference is held virtually, the ANU is built on Indigenous Australian land of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, and we acknowledge and pay respects to their elders past and present. Today, it is my pleasure to host the political update, which involves a 30 minute keynote address from three speakers, followed by a 60 minute discussion and Q&A session involving you all here online with us today. Youth led political reform movements are growing worldwide. And in Southeast Asia during the pandemic, youth or student movements are challenging the status quo and pressing for change. Malaysia is no exception, having recently lowered the voting age from 21 to 18. Today's political update is from three young Malaysian speakers who will talk about politics from their experiences and perspectives and what they think needs to change and how youth might go about implementing that change. Our first speaker is Kira Yusril from Undi 18 and Parliament Digital. Over to you, Kira. Thank you so much, Ross, for the introduction and uh, for having me this year in the ANU Malaysian Update. Once again, my name is Kira Yusri. I am the co-founder of Undi 18 as well as the Education Director. Uni 18 started as a grassroots movement in 2016 to promote a youth-centric agenda. How we do that is that we campaign for lowering the voting age here in Malaysia from 21 to 18. And in July 2019, we actually succeeded with the help of uh, YB Said Sadiq Sadur Rahman. But however, since then, we've expanded the work that we do to focus on uh, youth education, civic engagement, as well as running multiple other campaigns to push for um, other reforms here in Malaysia. The UNI 18 bill has enfranchised many young Malaysians, uh, specifically 7.8 million Malaysians to vote in the next elections. 3.9 uh, million Malaysians who were 21 years old and below would have been uh, il ineligible to, uh, to vote in the next election, but now are able to. And another 3.9 million of Malaysians who were not registered for elections before this would now be able to vote uh, without registering themselves thanks to the automatic voter registration bill that also passed together with UNI 18. So riding on the Undi 18's momentum, we scaled and expand our uh, outreach work and we launched seven new campaigns ranging from issues of uh, gerrymandering and equal votes, uh, issues of gender representation in parliament, uh, environmental issues, senate reform, as well as regional, uh, regional campaigns such as Undi Sabah, Undi Sarawak, as well as a policy related campaign called Tanaga Belia to focus on energy policies here in Malaysia. Now, besides uh, running Undi 18, this year, we also organise Parliament Digital. It is the world's first youth-led initiative to organise a virtual parliamentary sitting to propose recommendations to address the economic and health crisis in Malaysia. Parliament Digital came about when a few friends came together and we, decided, we discussed about how the Malaysian government used COVID-19 as an excuse to not have a parliamentary sitting. We felt that this was a bit ridiculous because it shouldn't be impossible to gather 222 representatives in a virtual call, either through Zoom or, or Microsoft Teams or even Google Meets, to have discussions and debates, especially when you've seen other countries such as the United Kingdom, Maldives, Sri Lanka, to move to a uh, virtual uh, parliamentary sitting or a hybrid parliamentary sitting. So we decided why not we show them that it's possible? We decided to organize an event called Parliament Digital or a digital parliament, and we opened applications after just two weeks of planning. Within two weeks of opening our applications, we received almost 7,000 applications to become a representative, nominations uh, of their friends to become representative, as well as applications to become observers. This was very unprecedented considering that you know, we were just a bunch of uh, young advocates. We did not have any machinery. We did not have many um, support from, uh, we didn't receive any uh, sort of like support from the government to push forward uh, uh, this, cam this campaign and this initiative. But we managed to raise up such 
a uh, such huge we managed to garner such huge attention that during the live stream of the parliament digital event on both days the 4th and 5th of july we received almost half a million views um, combined so we could clearly see that young people were craving a, for a platform to speak up about issues young people were thirsty and we were looking for um, you know avenues to to share our our views to share our woes especially considering the pandemic where so many um, young Malaysians were affected very critically by it. We had young Malaysians uh, going to unemployment. We had students from school children to university students move from um, physical classrooms to online with no preparation and no um, heads up whatsoever. We see how university students were being asked to leave their campuses and come back to campuses and then leave their campuses again uh, because the government couldn't decide on um, you know, the right uh, procedures. And then we could also see how government themselves were struggling with coming up with procedures because this is such unprecedented times. Um, I think Parliament Digital was extremely unique because it brought forward 222 unique independent voices to the forefront. We did not have participants who were representing their political parties during the debates. We did not have participants who were representing anyone else's interests except their own. We had participants as young as 15 and 16 year olds running surveys, interviewing teachers, interviewing their members of parliament themselves to ask about what are issues I should bring forth during this debate. This whole experience um, beyond just uh, 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 an initiative to showcase what young people can achieve and how uh, governments can support uh, young people. But it also showed that it also was an educational opportunity uh, to, to, to engage young Malaysians to show them what democracy is all about. It really portrayed a, or showcased an, uh, a platform or an effort for a diverse parliament because we had 30% women participation in the lineups. We could showcase even through the speakers of the house themselves, one of them who will be presenting later, uh, we had Wei Jiet and Ayman, both a young Malay woman as well as a, a Chinese, uh, um, a young Chinese man to, 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 to lead the debates and the discussions over the two days. I personally thought it was really invigorating and really refreshing to just see the excitement of not just the participants, but also from the general public, as well as parliamentarians themselves. We had audiences from uh, parliamentarians. We could, uh, we could see that uh, the MPs themselves were inviting the part parliament digital participants to come forth to share their views and to get their input. And hopefully this sort of engagement will continue um, after just parliament digital. Now, looking at po political activism in Malaysia, what does it mean? Recently, YB Said Sadiq, uh, the MP of Muar and the previous youth uh, sports minister of Malaysia, announced that he was launching a new political party together with 13 other uh, young Malaysians. These, like, these uh, sponsors or co-founders of uh, MUDA, the Malaysian United Democratic Alliance, made up of lawyers, activists, teachers, uh, scientists, doctors, uh, philosophers, um, and it looks very impressive uh, as an initial lineup. And I think uh, even on social media, they've gotten quite a huge attention just by launching one campaign or launching a hashtag. You could see that people were reacting to it so quickly and so, um, you know, positively and negatively. But what does it mean for young Malaysians actually? If we look at past examples, um, when we see how civil society leaders join politics, it does not, not necessarily mean that it is the best solution for reforms. Um, one example is, for example, uh, YB Maria Chin, who used to lead an, the amazing, you know, uh, movement of Bersi. You know, I think everyone worldwide can recognize um, how much she has sacrificed for institutional reforms here in Malaysia. She ran as an independent in uh, Pataling Jaya. A, uh, a constituent that is known for its um, you know, progressive voters and uh, of course it's an urban area and eventually she also joined the party uh, uh, PKR and you can see that in our system because she, and she was a backbencher parliamentarian it's very challenging to push forward the reforms uh, uh, and ideas that she initially championed as a civil society leader and not only that um, but many other civil society um, Champions moved from uh, their work in the NGO to the government. Uh, even if they're not MPs, they work as political officers, press officers, researchers, advisors. And what you can see is that it left a vacuum within civil society where uh, it was very difficult to keep uh, the government uh, in check. 
So I think as a, um, I will consider myself, you know, a newer batch of uh, advocates here in Malaysia, honestly, right? Um, it makes people like me very cynical towards uh, political parties' intentions. So, and I think this uh, sentiment is shared across many other young Malaysians. And you don't even have to just look at Muda, right? What, political, what exactly can political parties offer us when it comes to reforms, when it comes to tackling issues of unemployability, come tackling issues of, um, of education? When you see many of the struggles that end up being publicized about political parties are always power struggles and uh, internal drama. So I think young people also are not galvanized enough in Malaysia yet to participate actively in politics. We still have laws such as AUKU, which has not been abolished uh, entirely, even though there was a promise by the Pakatan Harapan government. Uh, young Malaysians are still fearful of speaking up. Uh, the school, the school students still not, are not sure of what are their options when it comes to political participation. Beyond that, Malaysia also practices the first-past-the-post electoral system and Muda, like it or not, will have to eventually align with a uh, political coalition, whether it's one that has uh, parties like AMNO or PAS in it, or whether it's one that already has many um, you know, parties that stand on progressive uh, values such as PKR and DAP. And up to today, they have not announced any serious political or electoral strategy. So I think this also gives a, uh, puts a, forth a question to many young Malaysians and it will lead many of us to still be wary and be concerned on what actually Muda is standing for and why, um, you know, you could probably explain why there are still hesitance from young Malaysians to participate in a new political party even though it seems very sexy and very, you know, um, uh, their, their biggest uh, uh, selling point so far is that they have the youth interest at heart. But I think the question that we need to ask them is that, is that really enough? Is age alone enough to win elections? Um, so that being said, this is where I end my presentation and I'm very excited to also uh, hear from my colleagues uh, uh, Sadara Lim Weijet as well as Mahira from Undi Sabah uh, after this. Hi, my name is Wei Jet. I am a lawyer with an interest in human rights and public interest law. I've also been involved in human rights-centered civil society organizations for the past three to four years. I am a co-founder of MUDA, the Malaysian United Democratic Alliance. It is no coincidence that the acronym MUDA uh, also means youth in the Malay language. Uh, the idea of how MUDA as a political party started um, was really predicated from uh, Said Sadiq, Said Abdul Rahman, who was the former Minister of Youth and Sports and a uh, key politician from the previous Pakatan Harapan politician. And the backdrop to the formation of MUDA is a bleak one. I mean, it originated from the collapse of the Pakatan Harapan government after a mere 22 months in uh, power. And uh, Pakatan Harapan's uh, entry into power is significant because uh, it displaced Barisan National, which ruled Malaysia for the past 60 years since independence. And um, what there was, well, there are many theories as to why Pakatan Harapan collapsed. One of the core reasons that we can't deny is the fact that there were clashes between top leaders of Pakatan Harapan on a personal level, uh, stemming from decades of mistrust and unclear transition process. And I think that. Um, that allowed the opposition to exploit and, and that led to the collapse. I think that coupled with the political hopping that is going on uh, led to a lot of disillusionment, particularly among the youths in Malaysia. And the youths do form a core support base of Pakatan Harapan. And the fact that you know, youths went out in droves in 2018 to vote for a democratically elected government of their choice to only see it fall apart so easily, I mean, it really drives home and, and motivates us to believe that there is a need to create a political party. There is a need to create a party that prioritizes the people's welfare and the survival of a democratically elected government above personal differences stemming from decades of disputes. So that is how the idea was conceptualized. Then Syed Sadiq, um, did try to engage as many people as possible uh, and he 
a, a, accumulated a group of technocrats, entrepreneurs, social activists, community organizers from all across Malaysia to try to get their input as to whether a youth-centric political party is viable and more importantly if it is necessary in the political climate today. And I think that um, in the initial stages there may be heated debate as to whether MUDA should be a movement or a political party. I think in the end we decided that you know it you really need a political party as a vehicle for change uh, to have that voice being heard and to have leverage on how change can be made. And I think that you need to have skin in the game at the end of the day. And so um, the idea was conceptualized and uh, it was formed. And I do think that um, this party, as Said Sadiq has emphasized many times, is not about himself. It's not a, po a political party that is personality based, but it's driven from the ground up. So we have engaged um, youths uh, throughout Malaysia to get their views on what this party should stand for, what policies this party should advocate for, and how different uh, does this political party need to be in the, in the Malaysian political climate. Uh, I think that in general was, was how MUDA was formed. And why am I interested to, why did I decide to join MUDA as a political party? Um, it was not an easy choice. I think for many people, uh, for many politicians in Malaysia, joining a political party uh, will have consequences on your professional, your personal and your family life. Um, but what made me um, made that leap of faith is the fact that, you know, when I was assembled in this meeting with these 30 plus individuals, it was really inspiring and it, it electrified me. I mean, it sounds cheesy, but um, it, the fact that these people are willing to risk their careers and to, to attempt to make a change in Malaysia. I mean, change is not inevitable, but, you know, to even make that attempt, um, knowing that we may fail, uh, really inspired me and really made me uh, decide to go all in. And I think that uh, I did not want to regret 20 to 30 years later in life um, as to why I didn't join the political, this um, moment in history. Uh, so that was just why I joined uh, MUDA. And uh, we may not succeed in the end, um, but if, the, if you look at the trajectory of the youth movements, not only in Malaysia, but all over the world, we will damn well put on a good fight, that I can promise. Um, why is there a need for a youth-centric political party? I think that there are two key reasons. Number one, um, if you look at the problem of Malaysian politics, it really is the cancer of old politics. And when I use the term old politics, I mean the fact the culture of warlords in Malaysia, political warlords in Malaysia, whereby politicians for a particular constituency get elected to become an MP for many uh, terms without giving the youth an opportunity to rise up. The culture of buying loyalty through money, through gratification, the culture of character assassination, and ironically, the culture of old politicians acting childishly in parliament where you engage with jokes, ageist and sexist teasing instead of engaging with substantive policy debates uh, for the betterment of Malaysia. I think that is the old political culture that we really need to get rid of and I think that it is high time for a youth-centric political party to break into the scene to create the ripple effect. I don't think uh, with the greatest of respect, existing political parties uh, have the momentum to do that. The second reason is, is the issue of representation. And whilst uh, representation is important, I think that MUDA as a political party wants to go beyond that. We want to disrupt how politics in Malaysia works vis-a-vis -vis youth's participation. Because if you look at existing political parties, the unfortunate fact is that youths are often pigeonholed into youth wings. Uh, the same way uh, women in these political parties are straight-jacketed into you know, women wings. And there appears to be a glass ceiling. I mean, these youths rarely get the chance to rise up and 
they are probably only fielded as candidates once they reach their mid 40s their 50s so i do think i do sincerely believe that youth need to have a say and if you look at the malaysian parliament only two mps are below 30 and most mps are above 50 60 70 years old i do think that we need we need fresh voices in parliament because in general i do think youths bring a more idealistic progressive worldview when it comes to policies be it education be it climate change you know and be it the economy i think that kind of fresh reinvigorating views need to be injected in Malaysian politics and I think that Muda as a political party wants to bring that change. What are the challenges of Muda as a political party? I think two main challenges. Um, the first, and this is not unique to Muda, uh, is the first past the post system in Malaysia. And if you look at uh, historically wise, um, third force political parties have not been very successful. Um, whenever there are three cornered fights, um, the third force often loses to the point where they lose even their deposits in the political contest. So if you look at um, the Socialist Party of Malaysia, for example, they had an, an incumbent MP in Dr. Michael Jayakumar, who was very popular with, the, with his constituents, yet, but yet you know, he, he lost his deposit in the uh, last general election. So that is a very um, pressing concern that we will need to address coupled with the fact that a general election is probably going to be held and or must be held in the next two and a half three years uh, we do not have the luxury of time so i think muda cannot discount the fact that it may have to enter into some kind of political coalition with other parties or if that does not materialize you know we have to be very strategic in where we will want to field candidates in elections I think the second key challenge of Muda is to dispel this notion that um, Muda is naive, too idealistic, uh, or too inexperienced in policy making or to play an important role in politics. I think the general perception among uh, some in Malaysia is that youths are not ready yet. Um, and I think that we do need to recruit the requisite number of technocrats and professionals and people who have really um, made it in their careers in their own right uh, to join our party to bolster the, the the party to ensure that there is always you know rejuvenating um, solid proposals economically healthcare wise education wise uh, when we do enter parliament one day and to not only uh, to prove that we are not only a fresh face but we are more than that we want to bring a new brand of politics but also policy making i think that is the, the, the challenges that muda would need to address uh, in the near future thank you thanks Rajat. um hey guys uh, my name is mahira i'm a lawyer as well as the program coordinator for nisaba and i generally got involved in activism just by caring about an issue first Care about a lot of things, climate change, feminism, etc. But for me specifically, when I came back to Sabah after I finished my studies, was the statelessness issue. Then it branched out to parliamentary reforms and political activism because I grew to realize that people, aka voters, need to be politically engaged and involved to change the things we wish to see. So that's me. So Undi Sabah was established just a few days after the fall of the state government then. So we decided that youth needs to make their voices heard. So a bunch of us were from Parliament Digital, like most of us. And that's where that's how it started. So our move, movement aims to empower youth in Sabah to be more politically involved and to sort of bridge or fill in the information gap with regards to politics by improving political literacy. So all of the members were, you know, were people from different and various polit like political leanings and background. Um, I think the recent Sabah election was very complex that even locals are still trying to unpack it. I think if we observe most elections in the world, we see that there is a, a 
there is an increase in polarization. And I do think that it is also the case in Sabah. I do believe that the outcome of the election was a result of both this being worried for their livelihood, safety, and generally just bread and butter issues. And especially in the midst of a global pandemic, you tend to care about what you're going to get right now. So it's about which political party or coalition that can ensure that voters' welfare will be taken care of. So in Sabah, um, the issue of statelessness or undocumented migrants have always plagued us since the 70s. So taking that into context, um, contrasting the two coalition that exists, on one hand, you have a camp which focuses on trying to reassert their power against the federal government, things like being able to have being able to have their own autonomy to self-govern and voters were under the presumption that this may or may not be a prerequisite to getting more resources for the state but principally it's about taking control of our state and also rally under the you know message of unity and celebrating differences and as a, a party like a part a major party under that coalition kind of won the most seats and this um and this camp kind of won the overall votes in the state but they didn't win as a coalition so they didn't win enough seats to form um the form the government on the other hand you have a camp which operates in a more tribalistic and nationalistic sentiment claiming that unlike the other coalition we're not going to associate ourselves with uh immigrants or we're not going to help them because they're the ones, you know, taking our resources and etc. So on top of that, the accusation towards the opposing party by attaching them with labels like pro PTI, which locally means um, pro-immigrant, made it clear that it's their stance. So this coalition won the state election. So both vision do lead to the same conclusion, which is to ensure that voters will be safe and your quality of life will be better once you vote for us. But the side that won the coalition are the ones which promise, which promises that they're not going to associate themselves with immigrants and maybe do something about it. They never said what it was, but voters seem to believe them and voters seem to buy into that narrative. So this immigrant and stateless issue became a very serious issue this election that it never got this bad. You get completely polarized views and on it and that's where it divides people because when I was small it, like you know when back then it was just a small issue and there were just like microaggressions and all of those things but it never became this serious but this election we see that it became the deciding factor so from Undi Saba's perspective there were so many candidates and parties contesting in the last election. So our campaign kind of focused on opening up a discussion by engaging with everyone across the political spectrum and divide to kind of let people decide or make their own informed choices, but mainly to let them, you know, be exposed in the discussion. So I understand that everyone have their own biases, but just by the virtue of having the people they support to be there with the presence of people from other you know, parties or representative from other parties or just there they can be exposed to just generally diverse views. So yeah, so that's us. So whilst I do think that Muda's intention is noble, but also very powerful in trying to break, you know, the culture of old politics and warlords and politics, I the challenges in Sabah I do believe are very different because I think Sabahans in general, which includes the youth, are very much concerned about the Sabahan agenda because since forming Malaysia, it seems that they are not being treated as equals or acknowledges equals, and this is reflected in the constitution policies as well as the literal development of their states. So the imbalance in power dynamics makes it very difficult for Sabah to kind of self-govern themselves, and this will impact things like immigrants in Sabah, um, infrastructure, internet connection, having an assembly meant from an Islamist party that Sabah has never consent to, but being shoved um, to them, and, you know, welfare and all of these issues playing Sabah are because of, you know, the, the imbalance in power dynamics that they have no control over that these things are happening to them. So 
I guess um, in Sabah or Sarawak, MUDA will need to compete with parties who are very loud and clear about fighting for the Sabahan agenda or Sarakin agenda. So they really need to know how to position themselves in that climate. So I think whilst the mechanism of MUDA um, to be more policy centric, you know, with uh, to be more transparent and less hierarchy, um, I do think that the prerequisite for them to kind of earn the East Malaysians' trust, especially in Sabah and Sarawak, I is whether you would fight for the Sabah agenda because all parties in Sabah and Sarawak are claiming that they're the ones championing it. So that's the barrier, I think, because if you want to talk about, you know, policies that will improve the lives of Sabahans and Sarawakians, like everyone promised that every other election. So why, you know, why is this youth-led movement any different? So I don't think it's it's impossible for Muda to set foot in East Malaysia since we do, like in Sabah, we do have a Malay nationalist party dominating our politics, yet we don't have natural Malays and Malays are minorities here. Um, but Muda is a multicultural party with progressive, you know, mechanisms and reforms could definitely set their foot once once they earn that trust from East Malaysians. But I do think Muda's presence nationally was already shifting the Overton window because I do agree that in Sabah's politics, it is dominated by, you know, more seasoned and veteran politicians. And it is evident in the recent, you know, lineup of state cabinet administration. So the presence of Muda kind of shifted that mood in the recent election we observe political parties claiming that they have youth they have young people they have young women they have the youngest candidate um you know in Sabah which is unprecedented so political parties ride on that wave as well which is refreshing because it looks like they're more accepting of youth being in politics but obviously I don't deny that maybe they're just using us as tokens but if political parties are also championing for the youth whilst being in touch with local sentiments, where does Muda position themselves then? So it's about trying to move past that. So I think um, one of the main challenge of Uni Sabah is obviously trying to reach people within rural areas and you have to take into consideration of Sabah's geography and how everyone's far from each other and it's very difficult to you know connect to one another because in some areas um, they don't have proper roads for you to go to their community and in some in, in to access some communities you need maybe boats to travel to their villages and in some area in some in most of these areas they don't have proper internet connectivity so for you to send messages of advocacy and i think that was one of only sawa's you know biggest barrier especially i think in in today's context uh, the challenge is more be difficult because of covid but just in general, for youth political activism in East Malaysia, you require a lot of resources for you to reach these communities. And it's a huge hindrance, especially for youth, because they're mostly, you know, students or they're just starting their career. But hopefully um, youth and, you know, other people in other communities could coalesce in trying to reach these communities to advocate for social change. Yeah. So this now um, ends the presentation from all of us, and we will now move to the live discussion and Q&A. Thank you. Well, welcome everyone. And I hope you enjoyed the Keeney TV presentation um, and production. We, we did try something new this year during COVID times. Obviously, this is the, the first time we've uh, I tried that so hopefully you enjoyed the collaboration and uh, there was a bit of a lag there I think that's what happens when you play a video through zoom there's not much we can do about that but thanks for thanks to our speakers uh, Kira Wajet and Mahira for for going to the trouble of, of pre-recording their uh, speeches and they were really compelling um, and so uh, again in this idea of, of trying something new I guess we we thought that there was um, a really interesting um, youth movement here in Malaysia worth discussing and obviously there's been so much going on in Malaysian politics and lots to discuss. If you'd like to ask a question, um, you can do so in the Q&A chat group. Uh, initially, we were going to open it up for others to give speeches and talks and so on and ask questions uh, to the camera, uh, but the, the registration just got too big. So we're, we're now going to um, we're now going to just keep it um, to questions uh, by written format and I'll do my best uh, to go through them uh, over the next hour. 
So congrats to you all first and, and foremost on, on Parliament Digital. I thought it was, you know, one of the most really exciting things to come out of Southeast Asian politics in the last uh, 12 months. And it's a, a really great initiative to see uh, young people using digital technology and, and promoting democracy in that way. Um, so I, I think, yeah, that's, that's the main reason why we thought we, we'd, we'd get you on these kind of initiatives rather than, a, you know, a professor of political science to talk through what's been happening in elite politics uh, in Malaysia over the past uh, while. But by, by all means, the questions um, may, may get to these discussions. Um, I'll ask a few questions to kick us off and then I'll, I'll start to read through some of the, the Q&A questions. And I guess the first question is just to ask, a, a, I presume you're all watching with interest, the um, protests in Indonesia uh, and in Thailand, the student movement, student protests that are going on there. Um, and this has happened very recently, but I'm wondering whether you see, you'll expect we'll see more of this in Malaysia, um, whether youth movements will move to protest and whether there are comparisons that you would make here between the disgruntlement from youth in neighbouring countries or, or is Malaysia a different case? Maybe Kira, over to you first. Uh, yeah, thanks for the first question. I honestly don't think that we will uh, be reaching that breaking point soon. So I think what Thailand is experiencing, the student movement there, that they've reached sort of a breaking point where they really feel like they can't, they don't see any other options anymore when it comes to voicing out their opinions and their grouses uh, towards the government. But I think in Malaysia, I, I genuinely think that we are not there yet. Uh, and what I mean by that is that, uh, I, for me, I see protests as a, as a form of um, um, speaking out when there are no other um, options available. But in Malaysia, young people still don't uh, even have that civil option yet because they are not exposed to uh, 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 what are the options even, right? So an example is that when I, when I run workshops and I speak to my students, a lot of them don't see, uh, they don't see um, that certain, that they don't see certain things as rights that, that they, have to, they, have the, they have the right to speak up, they have the right to question, they don't see that yet. So until we, uh, the majority of our Malaysian students are able to critically analyze of what's happening around us, I don't think that we will reach that breaking point soon enough. This is also probably why you see many protests uh, looking at in uh, the track record in Malaysia. Many of that happens in cities and you don't really see much involvement from, uh, uh, from Malaysians in other states. Um, I think in, in KK, they did organize the Women's March to coincide with the one in we hold, we hold here in Semenanjung. But even then, it's only in KK and you don't see the same thing happen in Sarawak or Johor or Perlis or Perak. Um, so I think we have not reached that breaking point yet, in my opinion. Yeah, Mahira, you're nodding. You're agreeing with, from, the, from the Sabah perspective there. Um, yeah, so... Um, I like I agree that there's no appetite for that yet because as far as Sabah is concerned with our obviously current state right now, um, Malay we're uh, Malaysia's COVID red zone, so people are a bit apprehensive if we're talking right now. Um, even though there's a lot of things happening um, that in our state that we wish like we could change or been done differently, but generally uh, massive rallies and protests of a larger scale are much stronger in Kuala Lumpur or in Selangor and most youth or students do go to West Malaysia, you know, to further their studies to or to kickstart their career. So compared to KL, I think um, protests or, re you know, rallies are not like as much celebrated or there's no appetite for it yet. But, you know, anything could happen. It depends on the mood and appetite of people at that time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd just like to add that um, in the past, we are not alien to youth-led student movements. So if you look at the 1970s, we had the Baling protest where, you know, Anwar Ibrahim himself, you know, led the protest against poverty. But what happened in 1975 was, pursuant to those student protests, the government amended the University and University Colleges Act to heavily restrict students from being involved in political parties and political movements. And as a result, you know, our university students and youth in general have been living in a very, um, you know, sanitized environment, quote unquote, for, for so long. And, uh, but in recent events do show that the youths, when the moment calls for it, they will mobilize, uh, for example, in the birthday protest or the protest against one in DP, 
there's a sizable youth uh, population that join in those particular protests. But the underlying structural problems, i.e. Um, the prevention of political parties from you know, penetrating into campuses, uh, the, the fact that there's no student autonomy when it comes to uh, student unions. I mean, those kind of things really inhibit the ability to, to think critically or to, to, pre- to stop students from even thinking of, of joining this kind of civic uh, movements in general. So that is something that we will need to address. And that is something that youth in Malaysia need to wake up to, you know, that there is, there is those kind of options and there, there are critical issues out there that you, you may need to be called to enter into a, a protest movement at a particular point in time. But at this juncture, I don't see any defining public issue that would trigger this kind of youth, uh, this kind of youth-led uh, protests, not at least at this juncture. Yeah, thanks. That, that frames things interestingly, which sort of leads into some other questions I had around some defining, you know, junctures in Malaysian politics. Because as long as anyone that has, you know, starts to study Malaysian politics, we're, we're taught about ethnicity is, is crucial for understanding, you know, Malaysian politics. So it's defined by ethnicity rather than demography. So I kind of wanted to ask that question of whether demography is more significant or whether the polarizing topics around Malaysian society are entrenched in youths as well. So what can you tell us about engaging with um, Malay youths and Malay attitudes towards say the role of Islam in the state, the Bumiputra policy, uh, rights of Malays, so on. Kira, to you first and, and then to others. Um, I, can't, well, I can't say definitively that we've engaged many people or even you know, many Malays on this topic. But I think if we take a, um, a step back and look at these conversations and you know, in, in academic circles, in our activism circles, we do, want, we do want to look at this topic a lot more. But you, clearly, but Malaysian youth, we don't, have that, um, that, we don't have that platform to have these difficult discussions because there's always that fear that if you talk about Malay rights, if you talk about Bumiputra privileges, you are either questioning the status quo or you're, um, you're not sure what you're talking about, right? People always, so if, for example, if you're not Malay and you want to talk about it, they'll just be like, okay, this is not something that you should ever talk about because you're not affected by it. Um, but the, the point, but the thing is, the, all these special rights, all this different treatment that you receive, either from institutions or the government or even the general public in a form of social stigma, this affects every single person, right? And kids grow up in school knowing that there are double standards, um, uh, there are opportunities that are just not available to them or uh, privileges that are, up, uh, that are free for them to take up. So, but I think um, political parties do latch on to these ideas and these sentiments and play heavily on them, regardless of uh, which political party they are. Uh, I think especially looking, looking at the major ones, even parties like DAP, all that, they would still, they try their best to be uh, inclusive and diverse, but you still have players within the party that when you go campaign, you see them uh, using and playing on these uh, racial sentiments as well. So I would say that the discourse in Malaysia still have not progressed past that. And because of that, um, and these discussions and discourse only stay within academic circles and, um, and, and intellectual discourse like this, political parties will still use that as a weapon when it comes, especially nearing to elections, because they know that this is an extremely hot button issue and they will not, be, they will not hesitate to press on it. I think I'll be interested to see if MUDA is to tackle these kind of issues because I don't think, I, I think every political party and politicians knows how dangerous it is to actually, um, you know, bring this up and, 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 and one way or the other using it as a form of uh, a weapon in their political strategies. All right, Wei Jet, what, what's your, is MUDA inclusive of those range of perspectives? I think when MUDA was conceptualized, I think we, we aim to be as inclusive as possible. So, uh, and we also set forth very clearly that we will adhere to the Rukun Negara and the Constitution. So that means that nobody's going to dispute the role of Islam as the religion of the Federation. No one's going to dispute that there are certain affirmative action policies and trends in the law for Bumiputra communities for specific areas. So we are quite clear on that. Uh, but having said that, I do think when it comes to the issue of ethnicity, it really depends on where the voters are from. So if you look at more rural areas, uh, perhaps the issue of ethnicity, race and religion plays more heavily, but if, as you move towards the semi-urban and urban areas, it plays a lesser role. So I do believe that there is a growing electorate that is 
proud of who they are, of their identity as a Malay Muslim or a Chinese Buddhist, for example, but they also recognize that when it comes to electing the representatives, there are a host of many other issues that they do consider. And race and ethnicity is not the be all and end all. And uh, I think that it is our duty as a political party and, and politicians to not pander to insecurities and to the worst fears of people and the mistrust between the races. I think that is what uh, Syed Sadiq has made it quite clear uh, in, in, in conceptualizing Muda. And I think that as a person coming from a minority in the city, that also is personally very important to me. I mean, um, in for the past three to four years, the kind of toxic brand of racial politics in Malaysia is really disconcerting. And I do generally believe that the youths are perhaps um, less inclined to buy into those kind of race baiting in general. So it is our duty to first show that, you know, whilst identity is important, there are issues like the economy, job creation, climate change, quality of education, youth specific issues affecting you, which should matter us as well. And number two, we should also point out that the other political parties out there that are politicizing race and religion don't actually generally believe in pushing for you know, your race and religion to be protected, but they are merely using it as a tool to gain political power. And I think that we have, we also have to point that out at the same time. So that is yeah. perhaps how Muda would like to approach the subject. Right. Mahira, you just lived through a, an election campaign um, and in your presentation, you talked about the identity politics that was central to that campaign and polarising. Did you get a sense that there was different attitudes amongst youth on these issues? Um, well, um, with respect to, um, you know, role of Islam or Bumiputra policy, like it wasn't, um, I don't think it was like heavily discussed um, in, uh, during the recent Sabah uh, politics. Yeah, but I do agree with what has been said by both of them. I think they explained it well. Um, it's still a very sensitive topic and people are still apprehensive about it. But at the same time, I do think that youths, you know, are less likely to kind of like buy into these narratives of like fear mongering and um, yeah. And that is reflective in the Saban election. I'm not sure as what to, uh, what will happen in West Malaysia though, but like as for Bumi Putra policy and rights of Malays, I don't think it And migrant much. workers, what, in your presentation, you talked about that. Was there a d clear, did you think a demographic ish, a divide there in, in that as an electoral issue? Oh, yes, definitely. So for in Sabah, like specifically, um, so that issue is the, um, I guess, like the turning point of like how, uh, of how people decide or who do they vote for um, and how political parties are going to deal with these issues. So I think um, people are rather polarized on that. And um, it seems that people are still, you know, buying into the um, narrative of like, you know, Sabah are for Sabahans. And, you know, we have to protect our land, like, for us. And, you know, like, these narratives are still being, being used. I guess, like, the context is just different in Sabah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, we ha have a, a question from Professor Meredith Weiss, who's well-known uh, to us here at ANU and also in, um, in Malaysian politics. And her question's around patronage. Um, and not just flat-out patronage, but um, obviously that's that's a problem in Malaysia, splashing out on scholarship funds for, for young people, for example. Um, but she wants to know about the more endemic efforts to go to the ground, which have long swayed voters in Malaysia. So um, what kind of uh, civic education do you think that might convince new voters, people who between 18 and 21, perhaps, who are just uh, going to be voting for the, you know, for the first time, uh, to not be swayed by the fact that they or their families benefit from patronage? or by a candidate's personal touch? Should we assume that younger voters today or even new youth candidates will perform differently? So I guess she's talking about the systemic nature um, and whether, whether civic education, whether youth will be any different. Wayjet, perhaps for you first, and I know this is something that you've thought about previously at Muda. I think uh, when the voting age was lowered from 21 to 18, I think one of the major concerns that we have is that our education system simply is not prepared to educate and teach the young out there 
on how to make political choices, on what kind of things that you should not consider and what are things that you should consider. And so I think that it then therefore lies upon NGOs like the 18 and uh, political parties out there um, like Muda to really tell them that, look, at the end of the day, um, yes, the personal touch and the, the integrity and the personality of, the, of your elected representative is important, um, but more importantly, that the issues are going to define and affect your life 24-7, 365 days of the year. And those are the things which are going to really matter. So when it comes to job creation, education, and climate change, those are the issues that we need to instill are far more important than the personality. And how we go about that is perhaps a strategy that all political parties need, need to consider. I mean, we have seen how... Uh, certain political parties have innovated to use videos and infographics or TikToks, you know, we are talking about communicating with the younger generation today to try to creatively inform them that these are the issues which matter in a medium which appeals to them. Um, so, so those are the kind of strategies that political parties may have to instill. It's not an easy task to tell you that, you know, the economy is more important than this charming 40-year-old uncle who is giving you, you know, goodie bags. But it's something that we need to do and we need to move forward as a nation. Kira? Yeah, I think uh, so civic education, voter education is really uh, what we're trying to do here in Undi 18. And I think it's a core part of education reform that needs to be discussed about. Um, I think uh, video, I mean, sorry, voter education uh, is not just about political parties reaching out to, to potential voters, but also educators need to change their mindset, you know, and they, they need to be uh, prepared that when their students leave university or when their students leave high school, they, they are going to be voters and they're going to be deciding the country's future. So what kind of values and, and mindset that we want to prepare these students to have as they become voters and not, and, and to move and to, um, you know, to understand that it's not just about Voting, some, voting for people who, who's helping my family, uh, you know, who's helping uh, 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 my parents and things like that. But of course, different contexts have different, different areas and different contexts. So for example, in Borneo, they practice a lot more politics of development where the politicians need to be the one, you know, be there at funerals, they need to be there at weddings or else they won't, they won't get voted in. But I think more importantly, educators need to uh, uh, emphasize to students that your, the, the specific roles that different uh, representatives have. For example, we still, uh, we still, I still get students who don't know that city councillors are not elected, they are appointed. Uh, you know, when there's an issue of, the, of drainage issue, they will call their MPs and not a city council. So if we still can't um, understand the and uh, if you still don't know what are the roles the actual roles that our politicians are supposed to do it's very difficult for young people to evaluate them based on their policy stance ideologies and so on and so on and we often associate uh with politicians so i think our um, education system needs to be reformed to accommodate um uh, the legislation change uh, for undi 18 uh and we need to do it we need to start doing it fast because uh if a snap elections happen after the law has been gazetted, uh, there will be so much, so many more new voters in the system. And, uh, and, and I think it, it's actually even going to be very difficult for politicians and political parties to navigate this scene. Um, so I think it's actually a collective effort that everyone needs to work together and um, not just a concern for politicians and political parties. Okay, Mahira. Yeah, so um, I agree with Kira. I think just through giving more, like what we can do right now is just like by giving more education and awareness to voters, be reminders of what's right and wrong. But I do think that it's something that we can actively pursue even right now. But the thing is, I feel like some people might already know, but still like kind of choose them or it's laced with something that made it seem like it's something morally acceptable for voters to kind of justify their conscience, especially in rural areas. So those who have higher access to information or like to internet connectivity are more likely to be informed. So I, I believe that marginalized communities tend to be deprived of these things for them to kind of like, for them to be able to distinguish like um, what is like, you know, within the rules of these um, 
political parties or MPs, I think the younger generation are much more exposed to verified information and able to distinguish sources of news. So, you know, um, I guess we're hopeful because in the recent election, I do meet or bump um, into friends who's like frustrated claiming that their parents or their families in their hometown are voting for a specific candidate because they've been charitable to them and they're advocating, you know, them like not to be swayed by it. Um, so in my mom's hometown, like people get aid and donation every election, but you don't see that in rather urban areas, like like in my area or yeah, in urban areas of Sabah, but in, ra you know, like these aid are much more prevalent, prevalent in um, rural areas. So yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah, really interesting answers. Um, I might turn now to the uh, open questions that are, are coming through and uh, I'll try and get through. So please, uh, please do continue to send them through. Um, I expected this uh, way yet, so it's, it's good to get this one um, started. But a lot of questions on the pause Malaysia uh, comment. Um, perhaps we could, uh, we could knock that one off early. What do you mean? Uh, is it accepting the status quo to say that Malaysians should pause? I did note, I think the UMNO youth uh, leader also said we should uh, pause politicking just yesterday or today. Um, correct me if I'm wrong there, but um, I, so yeah, perhaps you could clarify what Muda uh, wants or was thinking in, in that comment. Uh, you're right in saying, well, in essence, there are many political parties and political actors which have essentially said the same thing, but they have not framed it as pause but no one has made an issue out of it. So really what we uh, intended to when we initiated the Pause Malaysia campaign is to really invite political parties out there to stop jostling for political, political, you know, political uh, realignments and to prevent parties and politicians from jumping here and there, which is the root cause of the instability that we are seeing today. And we are also asking for no general election in the foreseeable future until COVID-19 is addressed. So those are things which to me are, are quite common and logical in the pandemic that we have now and in the instability, political instability that we have now. Some people have interpreted to say that we mean to pause any kind of constructive criticism or any kind of um, uh, attacks towards other political parties for the statements that they make which was not the intention of Pause Malaysia. We have never said that we will not hold the government accountable. We have never said that we will not speak up against abuse of power or the wrongdoings of the government of the day. So I think that, that the messaging can be improved, I admit. Um, but I think that if you look at the, uh, the original statement and original intent of Muda, um, Pause Malaysia started from a very noble kind of uh, noble intention. And I think that uh, we do not... In so there's certainly no intent to stop discourse and stop criticism and accountability for the government of the day. Right, but you don't want to see an election. Uh, we don't want to see an election only because right. it's going to deteriorate even yep. further the, the COVID-19 pandemic. That we have. Right, which, which you've just lived through, Mahira, um, in do the Sabah election. Does that make sense to you, having seen the spike of cases in Sabah, that there should not be an election? Well, um, I... I I mean, like, I do believe that the election should be, um, should be done. I don't think it was like the spread of the, um, spread of the virus of COVID was due to the election per se. Because if we um, observe, you know, in countries like Singapore and Korea, they've um, held their elections as well and you don't see rise and spike. So there has to be like something in the mechanism as to how we actually conducted this um, election um, so, yeah, but because of how things have turned uh, in the Sabah election, so, you know, we really do have to assess maybe like our machinery or our um, system, what, what, what are the, um, I guess, like mechanisms that we need to put in place in order for like our democracy could be, you know, sustained or even assisted so people can participate in our democracy. But as we stand right now, I think a lot of people are apprehensive because we're not um, because of the rise in COVID. Um, so, yeah, I think people are apprehensive. But I, I should, I, I feel like previously it should, like it could be safe. It's just that something has happened that maybe could have been prevented. Mm. Yeah. Kira, what's your thoughts on the, the pause politicking argument that some youth 
leaders, including Muda, have, have said. Is this a case where um, they're doing their own politicking? This is, what, this is why you're a bit concerned about youth political parties? I think, you- uh, yeah, so I think the post Malaysia campaign is, it came out at a very interesting time, especially on Twitter. I think it got mm. the most reactions on, on Malaysian Twitter, especially because I think probably the day before there was the trending hashtag of Mujidin out. So I think, uh, I guess the general public were just confused like whether this campaign by Muda is to complement or to go against uh, that particular campaign. Uh, because, and it's quite amusingly enough, immediately after post Malaysia launched, PKR Youth tried to launch their own forward Malaysia campaign, uh, in, I, I, it looks like to be in response of that. So it became like a hashtag war on Twitter for about 24 hours or so, which I'm not sure should be what encapsulates youth politics in Malaysia. I hope it's not. Um, but I think if you look into the demands of post Malaysia specifically, I really um, can understand where they were coming from, especially in regards to the point of no elections, because like, even though Mahira pointed out there are countries that have succeeded in running elections rather safely, Malaysia did not do that. Right, Malaysia, our politicians were breaching SOPs, they were going around town, shaking hands, hugging, giving hampers and all that. And there were clearly, you know, uh, uh, no, no regards given to the situation that we're in at all. Not to mention that there were many campaigns, including by Berse, Udi Sabah themselves have launched a request to expand the boundaries of postal voting. Uh, and, you know, especially for the Sabahan diaspora in Semenanjung, Malaysia. So I think unless the election commission is willing and have the political or have the will to change the way we do elections in Malaysia, having another election, especially snap elections, is simply unrealistic. Uh, and, and, and in my opinion, quite selfish to demand. Purely because I think we have, I mean, we can, we can see how Sabah is really suffering right now. Every day, almost a thousand cases um, and majority of them are from Sabah. So I feel like, yes, we need to uphold democracy. And yes, we need to give people the right to, um, to, to voice out and to cast their and make the decisions. But we also need to seriously consider how, what, at what cost do, do these come with. And uh, I think if, um, and I'm not saying that there's a particular government, there's a particular side of coalition that deserves to be in government because in the end, you need the people to, to vote you in. But I think we also need to uh, uh, be realistic and not be as, uh, and not just assume that we can, uh, we can live life as normal, meaning that if there is a power struggle, we should call for snap elections right away because that is the only way to determine who deserves to be a prime minister. Yeah. So I think young people, um, especially, um, uh, I think you can see the responses to the campaign that's not, they are not by politicians. Many people could actually see the logic of why um, uh, Muda is calling for post Malaysia because they, they, they are the one feeling the brunt of the SOP breaching, the campaigning, and we are feeling it now even in Semenanjung, even in KL Selangor, when we are going on lockdowns after lockdowns, and we're not even sure whether we can still go and earn a living. So I think uh, there are just, there are multiple uh, facets to this, uh, the impact of this campaign, and not enough people are looking at it from, uh, 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 from different lenses and just assuming that, um, I guess, painting on a broad brush that Sadiq is supporting Tan Sri Mohigin as a prime minister. Mm. Yeah, I noticed you mentioned uh, Twitter there and uh, the blowback on that. And, and that leads to a, another criticism that might be had of all of you, although perhaps to Mahira less. Uh, and, and that is the, the urban secular youth network that you, you all mix in. And, um, and so I, I guess uh, Indonesia is a really interesting case of a youth party uh, that in the 2019 elections, um, you know, was driven by Jakarta urban youth uh, uh, groups and people and highly educated and, and with highly well-meaning ideas, but they didn't reach the 4% threshold. So the question is from Kian Wong, um, who's asking about whether there is a, a sort of this compromise from the outset because it because Muda is an urban secular youth network, but you could say that perhaps about um, you know, uh, other groups that you're involved in, given that Pass and Amno Youth Wings have already work on big party infrastructure uh, outside of urban areas. Wayjet, to you first. Yeah, I, I don't, um, I think there is a general perception. I don't blame that uh, Muda is a urban, urban centric party. Uh, but I do think that there is a concerted effort from Sadiq himself and many of us to include as many uh, youth representatives and leaders from 
you know, all across Malaysia, across all kinds of sectors and industries. And that includes, you know, people from the Orang Asi community in Kelantan to, you know, um, entrepreneurs or people involved in the agriculture industry in Sabah. There is that attempt to reach out. And I do think uh, we do not want to be a party that is only associated to be concentrated for urban seats and urban issues. At and is that day. possible, Wajet? I mean, like to get into Kelantan, isn't Pasan Amno Youth fully entrenched there that Muda has a, it's going to be difficult? Well, it's going to be difficult, uh, but that doesn't mean that there is no attempt that is, that is being made. Yes, there may, there may be focus, there may be made for place certain emphasis on certain states and certain types of constituencies, considering that a general election is going to come in the next two or three years. Mm. So, for example, we probably won't channel as much energy and resources to a particular seat, which we don't think is a viable kind of option in the next three or four years when the general election is going to be called. But I do think on a very broad level, there is no discrimination. We are trying to reach out to as many um, people as possible. We do run engagement sessions with people from the northern region, from the southern region. So there is that concerted attempt. Uh, whether it's successful or not, only time will tell. Uh, but yeah, in the, near, in the near term, however, I do want to say that there will be certain focus and emphasis on certain seats, bearing in mind that the general election is going to come soon. That's something that we want to focus on. Mahira, are these guys in a Bangsa bubble? Um, <laughs> I guess when it first started, they kind of had that perception, but I don't think they are. Um, they did try to, uh, you know, engage with a lot of um, communities. Um, they did engage um, people from Ongi Sabah as well. Um, uh, a lot of um, people from Sabah and different communities and activists as well. Um, on the outset, it kind of looked like it, but I don't think so. It's just because they're professionals and technocrats, but they're also actually from, um, you know, people from um, diverse background of different social class. Like, so YB Said Sadiq, from what I know, is not, you know, he's from a middle class family so I don't think it's mm. a bubble yeah mm. there's a question here from Arindoshi uh, Kira which uh, I think is a, a really good one it's asking um, that we are seeing a steady rise in youth movements um, how would it be possible to gain the trust of older generations of Malaysians who may seem skeptical of, of youths and of political parties so I, I guess what are the what do you what do you see as some promising common ground policies or issues which you might able to convince older voters, not just fellow youths, that your agenda, vision, and, and skill set are what the country needs. I would I would guess that this is a universal issue across any young person that's trying to prove themselves, uh, no matter what arena they're in, either politics or corporate or even in the activism world uh, here in Malaysia as well. We're constantly being uh, second guessed. We're constantly being like judged for uh, just because we're inexperienced. But I think. Um, if for, for young politicians who are trying to prove their worth, uh, I, would, I think I would honestly say that, you know, it's quite easy, not easy, but I think if you want to look at, uh, her, um, uh, I think, for example, if you want to compare against se seasoned politicians, yes, there are many great seasoned politicians, but if you look at Malaysia, there's actually many bad seasoned politicians as well. You know, politicians who have been in power year after year after year. And I feel like, um, as young politicians uh, or as young advocates or young uh, leaders rising up, this is an opportunity to pinpoint, um, you know, to, to focus, laser focus on the pain points of Malaysian politics and to prove that we are one of, we are the solutions or we are an alternative uh, for what's currently out there. So I personally think that, you know, uh, what, how young people can set themselves apart is to move away from the racial religion discourse uh, that's, that's being weaponized by existing political parties, make it issues-based, make it policy-based. Every time uh, a young leader, you know, whether in politics or outside of politics, like uh, Mahira and I, uh, you know, whenever we raise up concerns or issues, we need to be able to suggest good and concrete solutions to accompany what we're talking about. I think the, the biggest uh, uh, misconception that people have on young, young folks is that uh, you don't know what you're talking about or you don't have enough knowledge about these issues. But the thing is, um, you know, it's you know, information and knowledge is not that uh, uh, it's not very uh, uh, far reached anymore. Consider, especially when you look at the, some of the problems that Malaysia have, many other countries have already solved it. I think we need to young people can need to bring in their perspective of successful case studies around the world and see how we can uh, have 
even kickstart the conversation on solving these issues here in Malaysia. Just to begin with, is electoral reform, right? So many, like, like we, we keep mentioning, their elections can be done safely in a pandemic. So I think young people, young organizations uh, need to provide alternatives or start speaking up and, pres- and creating a, um, a larger pressure group uh, to discuss these topics and to consistently stand by uh, the solution that we are proposing so that we can make, it, make sure that our messages get across to people regardless of the generations and regardless of the age. Mm. Um, because I think when you distract them from what they assume us to be, whether it's Malay or Chinese or uh, 21 or 55, um, and just keeping the discussion focused purely on the issues and policies, um, I think you know, this is how we can win over or at least bring people together in the same, um, on the same uh, space to have, the, the, to have these discussions and to even talk about uh, these issues, the issues that, uh, that we want to champion for. Yeah, okay. Well, Jed, how would this work at a party level? So obviously, at some point, you're going to have to be part of some coalition of older generation um, Malaysian-led uh, older generation politicians and you know you've, you'd have been criticizing them throughout a, a campaign and <laughs> saying Malaysia needs to turn away and they'll have their own youth parties how do you then reconcile um to say that hey we're we, we've got a common ground well uh, joining a coalition is not a given so I mean there is an off chance that we may have to go it out alone so, but in the event that, you know, a coalition is an option that we want to exercise, I mean, I can't speak for the party now, obviously, this is my personal view. I mean, I do think that, you know, we can bridge common ground by perhaps, you know, making it a condition that, you know, there's a certain percentage of, of, of youth candidates that should be filled if we want to enter into some kind of agreement with Muda or something along those lines to, to justify the both sides on why, and, and how we can work together and how we can complement one another. And I think that, that is the bridge that we will need to, to form with one another. So to, in all honesty, I've not really had um, the, I've not really had the time to think about, about this particular issue on entering coalition at this juncture. But uh, I do think that, you know, in, as in, yes, there is a problem of old politicians and old politics dominating Malaysia. Um, but I, I do think that, no matter how we move forward, you know, there is still going to be a their involvement at the end of the day and we cannot disregard, you know, the older politicians out there. They are part of the problems, but they are also part of the solution. They can be part of the solution if we leverage and we manage to reach some kind of positive agreement with them. Mm-hmm. So I, 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 we cannot discount old politicians at this stage. I, 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 that's my message. Mm-hmm. Mahira, did you have anything to add? Yeah. Um, I... I believe like most Malaysians and obviously politicians promise that they will make Malaysia better or aspire to improve the lives of Malaysians. So like most policies or issues could be a promising ground if it's backed with data and evidence. If we're able to convince everyone, whether seasoned or veteran MPs or ministers, that a particular policy actually benefits most Malaysians and Malaysia in general, I don't think why it's like could be, you know, impossible. We've seen Undi 18 teams as well as YB Sadiq, uh, Syed Sadiq himself, approach MPs across, you know, the political divide, whether seasoned or young, to get bipartisan support for the policy to pass. So to convince like older voters as well as Malaysians in general, um, similarly, by leading through examples, I think, and I think they've shown it, uh, and this is our evidence. I do think that a lot of young ministers and politicians um, exhibited their capabilities, whether, you know, in office and uh, like in corporate sector. And I think um, even in the activism scene, so I do believe that prim- that's primarily why right now politicians start to care or start to include youth within their, you know, political discourse and have more engagement programs. So yeah, like we're very hopeful. I don't think like, you know, we can always reach to a conclusion common ground. Mm. Yeah. Um, there, there are a number of questions I'd like to get through, but one is inevitable also a little bit on, on the party hopping. Seems to be this is a big issue in Malaysian politics. Um, is there any, anyone like to, to tackle this question of how do we stop Malaysian politicians from party hopping? Is it a structural uh, issue that needs to change that requires, you know, regulation or is it an ideological one where if political parties have more clear ideological uh, policies, therefore you can hold them to account more when they jump? Uh, what do you think? Anyone want to jump in? 
Okay, perhaps I can jump in because I think Muda did release a statement recently on what we think are the reforms that are needed to prevent this kind of party hopping from, from you know, continuing to perpetuate in the near future. So our first proposal is to implement a recall election system. Uh, in, basically, it means that you know, if a particular uh, elected representative hops to another party, then the constituents in that particular constituency have the option if they have a certain percentage who have petitioned to, to do that, to demand for a, another for a by election, and uh, that defecting politician can recontest, but so can other parties, and the voters will have the ultimate choice on whether to choose the defecting politician or to choose another political party. So that is one option that would heavily disincentivize a particular elected representative from hopping to another party. Uh, the second proposal is really to, in it may be specific to Malaysia, but it is to ban politicians and elected representatives from being appointed to government leading companies. Because if you have seen how Tan Sri Muhyiddin has sought to consolidate his power, it is purely to appoint MPs into GLC chairman, GLC directorships. And I think that if we have a law to say that is a no-no, then there's not much option for a prime minister or a Menteri Bursa, a chief minister, to by loyalty of elected representatives um, through the award of positions in GLCs, which are very lucrative in nature. I mean, they come with perks and bonuses and cars and all sorts of, of, of benefits. The third proposal that we have, and it probably is also unique to Malaysia, is to um, split the role of Attorney General and the, and the Public Prosecutor. The idea behind it is that we want to create an independent director of public prosecutions. It is important because in the status quo, the Prime Minister may have certain influence on how criminal prosecutions are being done because the Attorney General is also the government's legal advisor. So we want to minimize whatever conflict, interest, conflict of interest that, that exists now as much as we can to prevent Prime Ministers from you know, using that kind of influence to either buy, to buy political support, uh, which is common in Malaysia because a lot of politicians are being charged for corruption and bribery in the courts now, and they have used that as a leverage for political realignment. So those in gist are what Muda has been proposing so far. But of course, there are many other things, like for example, giving equal funding for all MPs so that MPs don't feel they need to be beholden to the government of the day or they don't need to join the incumbent government to get funding for their constituents so that they are re-elected in the future. So there are many proposals and mechanisms that we implement that we would like to push for. Thank you. A anyone else like to jump? Yeah, I think uh, just to quickly add on, besides like what uh, Muda is suggesting to, to fix the problem of party hopping, um, but another problem I think that uh, actually Professor uh, Wong Chin pointed out also that the reason why, for example, the Sabah party hopping, uh, you know, in initially came came. Um, to this point, well, actually, it even started when Shafi became chief minister back then, right? When Sabah realized that they were going to be an opposition state, and what in every and everyone understand that when you are an opposition and you are an elected member of the opposition, your you will either not get your allocation or have your allocation reduced drastically. And this was a problem that PH also did not solve uh, when it came into power. They they uh, the improvement they had or they did give allocation, but it was much 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 smaller than uh, government. Uh, uh, representative. So I think, so when opposition members see that they begin their uh, their term as an MP or are doing on already in such an unequal uh, unequal play playing field, I think uh, this incentivizes them to to change their allegiances and to go back on the mandate that they were voted in from. So whoever is trying to solve uh, the the, the problem of party hopping in Malaysia needs to also look into this. Um, this issue and make sure that if you are in government, you need to ensure that both sides of the of the political aisle receives. If you are elected member of representation, you should you are entitled to the same amount of allocation to help the people. Sure. The okay. Yeah. Sure. So I think this this key issue as well was um, okay. um, as highlighted. Yeah. 
Okay, there's a, a question from Rama Shazi, um, and it's around the future of Malaysian industry. Obviously, uh, one of the questions we get a lot at, um, at Malaysia Institute events involving Malaysian students is this brain drain issue. And Australia, in fact, benefits a lot from the brain drain. And uh, a lot of uh, young people come to Australia and they come to study and please, you know, there's the ANU. Um, no, uh, but the, the brain drain is a, a huge concern for, uh, for Malaysia. Um, in the aftermath of the pandemic um, and presumably, you know, economic downturn globally and huge problems around unemployment and underemployment for youths. Uh, does anyone have an alternative vision, which is the theme of our update, the alternative vision of the future for Malaysian industry and this issue of, of low value add industries versus high value add industries? And, um, Mahira, I'm, I'm interested in what you think about employment prospects for young people in Sabah. Yeah, so um, unique to Sabah, I guess like we face some um, similar problem as well because even, um, you know, locals uh, from Sabah, youth um, from Sabah, like they do go to West Malaysia um, to start their kickstart their career there. So um, I do think it's because um, people are not um, romanticizing a lot of the um, uh, romanticizing a lot of the industries that Sabah could offer and I think the structure is like different you know um, so in Sabah like you can venture into agriculture or um, yeah things like agriculture or fisheries or arts that um, is not being I, I guess like there hasn't been ample support structure um, being given um, towards the youth in Sabah because I do think that um, Sabah is a a large country with, with a lot of natural resources, but I don't think that the government or the state government gives like ample support structure um, or vision or like how we could like kind of reinvent our economy. So um, I do think that there are, um, you know, um, efforts into pursuing that. And uh, yeah, so like I'm hopeful, but hopefully like it's, um, the government, the state government could um, do something about it, but we do face brain drain and I, I'm not sure what is the step like the government wants to take, but I do think there are ways that they could if they want to, yeah. Thank you. Um, to a couple of uh, quick questions, one to Wajet. Uh, what would you say to those who believe the current government is unsuited for the task of handling the crisis and hence electing a new government is the solution to our current problems? Well, I would say that ultimately there is a, a balance that you need to, to strike. So uh, do you want this current government to continue administering, which I also personally believe have not been performing up to par? But what is the other choice? The other alternative you know, could be another prime minister like Anwar Ibrahim, uh, but you will also risk the possibility of having a general election. And that is a real possibility uh, should Tan Sri Mwede advise the king to dissolve parliament. So I think that if you look at that from, pers from that perspective, um, you may risk a general election which may aggravate the COVID-19 situation even further and you know, the economic downturn could be even worse. So I do think that we need to adopt that kind of nuanced view at the end of the day. Uh, I do believe that we need to form another government preferably Buddha inside. But yes, we, we, we need to wait for the appropriate time for, for the general election. It is by no means me conceding that this political, this government is functioning and this government is some government that I support, but we need to look at it from a holistic point of view. Okay, thank you. A uh, question from Greg Lopez, uh, a good friend of the ANU and graduate of the ANU's uh, political science department. His question is to all panelists, do you think the Malaysian political system is inherently and systemically corrupt or are there just some cases of corruption? Kira, to you first. I don't think all politicians are corrupt, but I do agree that our political system allows for corruption to happen and to a certain extent do not... Um, yeah, it, it is definitely allows and maybe to a certain point even encourages because it gives you so much space for abuse of power. Yeah. Mahira? That's a short MCS. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I agree. Uh, I agree as well. Um, I don't think there's, um, there's enough safeguards and policies that, you know, that can be put in place to kind of just like control the powers of politicians. 
I don't think politicians are corrupt as well, but because there are gaps in laws and policies, so they kind of, you know, exploit them. And in the in the election itself, would you say that the campaign showed systemic levels of um, corruption on the ground, or it's largely isolated or in certain pockets that it? Um, like I said, like it happens. Um, obviously, in certain pockets, um, not pol- all politicians do it, but it's happening on the ground. And like there are no policies or, um, you know, safeguards that are being put in place. So uh, hopefully there will be in the future. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Wajet. Well, I used to have some hope back in 2018 that corruption would be stemmed and eradicated uh, when the new Pakatan Harapan government came to power. But obviously that has changed and uh, there are now open calls by certain political parties that it is okay to lobby for criminal charges to be dropped, something to that effect. So it's really sad seeing how Malaysia was poised to combat corruption, you know, in 2018 and at the level that we have now where, you know, the leaders are going to have a comeback. Uh, So corruption is a very serious issue and I think that MUDA does set up to, that is a huge priority for MUDA. We want to introduce laws which cap political funding, which prevent this kind of loopholes from happening and prevent corruption from further perpetuating. And I think that that is something that will play a huge role in the next general election to come. Mm. Thanks. I might finish just on a, a nice uh, softball question, but I think it's important given the success of Parliament Digital um, as a, a new model that um, showed to you know, Parliament, look, this is how it can be done. And it was in July uh, of this year. But uh, what now? Uh, what, what's, how do you sustain something like this to, to keep it going? Kira, to you first. I think that's a very good question because I think Parliament Digital really kick-started a, uh, a hype of uh, an all eyes looking at young people after the event. At least on my part, uh, we're trying to think about how can we continue to engage the group that's been impacted by the event by running either workshops, engagement and programs, but also we want to, at ODE 18, we want to try to create more innovative programs like this that provide the platform for uh, Malaysian youth to, to experiment and to play and to learn politics um, that, that, we, that they've never learned before, the way they never learned before, right? With outside the boundaries of the classroom and all that. Um, I think we are also trying, hoping to uh, um, introduce them to, to the concept of, you know, policies and not politics first. Because what we've learned in Parliament Digital that many of these participants have never been exposed to any form of political advocacy before. This is their first entry into, you know, what is uh, debating in parliament about, what are policies about even. So we're hoping to create or, or duplicate this form of uh, similar form of innovation in future programs. I personally am not sure if parliament digital will happen again next year because it was done in reaction to uh, the parliamentary sitting. But I do hope that, you know, we can at least consider um, and, and, you know, other NGOs and government to consider how can we innovate youth programs so that uh, uh, it's, not just, it's not just like a two, three day camp organized by the government and then they get, they learn about boring, boring, boring stuff and then, and then they just lose interest in politics or understand or, or policy. Mm. Mm. Mahira? Yeah, so um, I was helping out with Parliament Digital and most of the members um, in Undi Sabah were from Parliament Digital. Maybe even if like Parliament Digital wouldn't be host next year, but I do think like the impact was great enough that it mobilized a lot of youth into, you know, being more active and participative in politics. So I think that's a great step and that's a great turning point. And finally, Wajet, there's a question here from Diana. Diana Anwar, who's a, a graduate um, of the ANU, who's uh, asking, where does MUDA see itself in five years? So um, perhaps you can finish on that one. Well, uh, it really depends on when the general election will be called. Um, I do think that, you know, uh, if a general election is called in the next two to three years, we may have a very strong chance. Well, at least I believe that we have a strong chance of earning some seats in parliament. And I do think that we have to build on that um, to push forth for you, not only youth-centric policies, but a brand new kind of politics that focuses on issues, that focuses 
that br brings away from the personality-driven politics that we have today. And I think that that is the ultimate goal of MUDA, to make sure that youths are no longer at the back seat, but they are a driving force of Malaysian politics. And they, their time is today and not, not tomorrow. And that is the kind of uh, message that we want to bring. And I do think that there is a lot of hope in what MUDA can achieve in the next five years. Well, thank you to uh, all our panelists, Kira Yusri, Lim Wei Jet, and Mahira Mazuki. And uh, thank you to you all for uh, being here today. Speaking of today and tomorrow, tomorrow is in fact the economic update, um, which will be at 10 a.m. Malaysian time and 1 p.m. Australian time. And uh, we look forward to seeing you there. And on Friday will be our cultural update, 10 a.m. Malaysian time and 1 p.m. Uh, Australian time. So thanks uh, for everyone for participating in the political update and hope to see you again uh, tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.